Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walton. Negro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Uh, we're going to pretend that it's Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving! It is Thursday, November twenty second, two thousand eighteen, for you. And Thanksgiving time, uh, no doubt you are getting ready to uh, either travel somewhere or wake up in uh, some strange place and have a Thanksgiving dinner at someone else's house, perhaps. Maybe you're not traveling until later on and only traveling locally. Uh, that's neither here nor there, but I hope you have a good time doing it, and I didn't want to leave you without fresh content to go along with your fresh turkey or whatever else you may be having for today. I was advised... Uh, most frequently, that Thursday would actually be a pretty good day to have our second pre-taped podcast ready for you. And if we really, really, really had to leave one day for a rerun, perhaps we would go with Friday on that one. There's plenty of material. It's only an open question as to whether or not I'll have a chance to record it. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, enjoy your Thursday. What are we going to round up for you today? Uh, well, we'll treat it like a Thursday show rather than like a Friday show. I've been thinking about uh, maybe Friday would be a great day to go into some of the long reads we've had to leave aside. But uh, not sure whether we're going to get there or not. In the meantime, things that I have to round up for you for today's show. Of course, some of them will be slightly dated. You know how the news cycle moves these days. And so a story that I may have put aside on a Tuesday, let's say, hypothetically... Wink, wink. Might not necessarily be the freshest for Thursday, but some stuff that I think uh, we all want to note and get on the record, some of which is more timely than others. Uh, well, let's take a quick trip through and see what we have to share with you. I'll start with this note. You will likely have heard this already, but we didn't get it on the record on the show yet. Politico is the publication from which I've grabbed the news that troops at the U.S.-Mexican border will start coming home, which is good news, but also laughable news. Of course, uh, not only did the caravan disappear from the news post-election, but now the troops sent to meet them there are set to disappear before the caravan even gets there. Pretty much uh, making transparent the mockery that uh, the whole situation was. Anyway, like I said, Politico reporting this one uh, posted on Tuesday. This Tuesday past, as you know, because you're existing in Thursday right now, unless, of course, you've waited until Friday or even later to hear this podcast or, well, God help us if this is a rerun and you're hearing this in 2019. Okay, we won't even contemplate that possibility right now. Troops at U.S.-Mexican border to start coming home, says Wesley Morgan. Just bringing the news here. That's who's got the byline on this piece. All the troops should be home by Christmas, as originally expected. Army Lieutenant General Jeffrey Buchanan said in an interview on Monday, which meant that, uh, I guess, why withdrawing by a date certain, the invading caravan knows that they can just wait around for Christmas and then even perhaps treat themselves to a Christmas present of coming across the border when all the troops are gone, except the troops were never going to do anything about their crossing anyway. So come on in anytime you're ready, I guess. Because as you know, all Democrats are for open borders and we are also pro-crime. Uh, my favorite crime, um, let's see, uh, I'll take embezzlement. I would like to enrich myself. Uh, perhaps at someone else's expense. Uh, we'll go with that one. So if I I've, if someone wants to do some crime for me, I'm a little bit busy, can't get to it myself. But being a Democrat and being for open borders and crime, uh, I want to be specific. I don't want it just to be vague. Like I'll take any crime because some crimes are more annoying than others. Let's say the uh, that that's really honestly. I I just I'm, I have to indulge them occasionally. All right, we're ready to figure out about what's going on about the troops at the border. The 5,800 troops who were rushed to the southwest border, and remember when it was going to go as high as 15,000? Imagine that. 
rushed to the southwest border amid President Donald Trump's pre-election warnings about a refugee caravan will start coming home as early as this week, just as some of those migrants are beginning to arrive. Ha ha. What do you know about that? Uh, I, 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 that's actually faster progress than I thought they were going to make. Democrats and Republicans have criticized the deployment as a ploy by the president, which it was, to use active duty military forces as a prop to try to stem Republican losses in this month's midterm elections. The general overseeing the deployment told Politico on Monday that the first troops will start heading home in the coming days as some are already unneeded. They were all already unneeded, having completed the missions for which they were sent. The returning service members include engineering and logistics units, whose jobs included placing concertino wire and other barriers to limit access to ports of entry at the U.S.-Mexico border. All the troops should be home by Christmas, as originally expected, Army Lieutenant General Jeffrey Buchanan said in an interview on Monday. Uh, Our end date right now is 15 December. What kind of a Euro trash date is that? 15 December, and I've got no indications from anybody that will go beyond that, said Buchanan, who leads the land forces of U.S. Northern Command. On Tuesday, Buchanan's command appeared to backpedal on his statement after critics of the deployment called the decision to wind it down so soon new evidence it was unnecessary in the first place. I mean, maybe we should have kept our mouths shut so that those guys could get home sooner rather than later, but I mean, how do you not call it out, right? U.S. Army North issued a brief statement insisting that, quote, no specific timeline for redeployment has been determined. I think they can just say that and stick to the original plan. I don't know if it's necessarily a backpedal. It's just an obfuscation. And you shouldn't go around announcing when troops are going to move, just generally speaking, and even though uh, they're not in any danger here. As a matter of good practice, it's probably best not to Not to do that. The plan to begin pulling back came just weeks after Trump ordered the highly unusual deployment. In previous cases in which the military deployed to beef up security at the border, the forces consisted of part-time National Guard troops under the command of state governors who backed up U.S. Customs and Border Protection and other law enforcement agencies. But the newly deployed troops, most of them unarmed and from support units, come from the active duty military, a concession the Pentagon made, and I guess it had to be asked of them, and they made it, after Trump insisted that the deployment include not just the National Guard, which is basically a huge crap on the National Guard. But, hey, you know, who cares, essentially? Buchanan confirmed previous reports that the military had rejected a request from the Department of Homeland Security for an armed force to back up Border Patrol agents in the event of a violent confrontation. That is a law enforcement task, and the Secretary of Defense does not have the authority to approve that inside the homeland, Buchanan said. The closure earlier Monday of one entry point along the California border near Tijuana, Mexico, was only partial and did not require more drastic measures, Buchanan said. About half of the lanes were closed this morning, but that's it, he reported. No complete closures. What, did Chris Christie get a hold of this? Other ports might be closed fully in the future, he said, but he did not anticipate any need to take more drastic measures. If CBP have reliable information that one of their ports is about to get rushed with a mob or something like that, Has anybody suggested that? Uh, Well, that could put their agents at risk. They could ask us to completely close the port, Buchanan said. You understand the importance of commerce at these ports. Nobody in CBP wants to close a port unless they're actually driven to do so. The troop deployment should start trailing off as engineer and other logistics troops wind down their mission of building base camps and fortifying ports of entry for the Border Patrol. Army and Marine engineers have now emplaced, emplaced? Okay. About 75% of the obstacles they planned to, including concertina wire, shipping containers, and concrete barriers at ports of entry. Once we get the rest of the obstacles built, we don't need to keep all those engineers here. As soon as I'm done with a capability, I love the way they manipulate language. As soon as I'm done with a capability, 
What I intended to do is re-employ it. Intend, sorry. I made it out even worse in syntax than it really had to be. As soon as I'm done with a capability, that is one of the things of which I'm capable, that's a capability. And as soon as I'm done performing that capability, I what I intend to do is redeploy it. Buchanan said, I don't want to keep these guys on just to keep them on. Wow, military speak. Logistics troops, too, will be among the first to head home. I will probably ask to start redeploying some of our logistics capability, Buchanan predicted. Now that things are set down here, we don't need as many troops to actually build base camps and things like that because the base camps are built. Thanks. That's great. Among the troops who will remain after construction engineers and logisticians, I guess, uh, start departing are helicopter pilots, planners, medical personnel, and smaller quick response teams of engineers who can help Border Patrol personnel shut down traffic at their ports of entry. In contrast to the speed of the deployment in early November and the fanfare surrounding it, the withdrawal prom uh, promises to be slower and quieter, but Buchanan expects it to be done before Christmas. That doesn't mean it's impossible, he added, but right now this is a temporary mission and we're tasked to do it until the 15th of December. Hmm. Okay. Well, just so you're up to date on that one. I thought that was worth noting, at the very least. Other uh, interesting things that I've put aside here uh, include, uh, well, let's see. There's uh, this interesting piece from the Washington Post the other day. I thought this one might be worth Checking into a, one of the monkey cage entries here. Matthew Graham and Milan Svolik have put this one together. Also from the 20th, asking the very important question, when Trump stretches democratic norms, and you could fight all day about what that even means and why oh, that belongs in the headline, when Trump stretches democratic norms, do voters care? We spoke a little bit uh, yesterday, uh, or rather... Uh, on Tuesday, haha, <laughs> get it, uh, about the, uh, well, both on Monday and Tuesday, about the Jim Acosta situation, whether or not he was in fact getting his pass back and whether or not they were going to continue to fight. And I'm still not positive that their announcement from Tuesday means exactly what they say it means or what we've been led to believe it means. But, uh, I mean, that's a stretching of democratic norms. There's been plenty. It just happens to me this is the one that's illustrating the piece at the moment. Um, but uh, it's a good question, something to uh, ponder, especially right after the election. And we think we know what the results mean. And, but I guess we ought to ask ourselves whether any of the norm breaking really sunk in with voters or were they just generally fed up with Trump or did all of it make an impact? No particular one versus another had more impact. But I mean, I would guess that there were a lot of people out there just saying, you know, we got to put an end to this norm breaking as soon as possible. But let's see what they have to say on the uh, political science side here, besides my just guessing. This month, the Trump presidency hit a new low in its already difficult relationship with American democratic norms. On November 7th, President Trump fired Attorney General Jeff Sessions apparently because he recused himself from special counsel Robert S. Mueller's investigation of the Trump campaign as the law requires. The next day, the president suspended the White House press credentials of CNN's Jim Acosta for reporting on him critically and threatened to do the same for other journalists who do not treat the White House with respect. That's quote. Uh, the day after that, Trump falsely accused Democrats of voter fraud in Arizona, Florida, and Georgia, where his favored candidates appeared to be losing ground as ballot counting continued in closely contested races. As a candidate and president, Trump has tested, and in some instances broken, established norms of democratic politics. He has expressed admiration for autocrats and reacted with indifference to violations of democratic principles abroad. Yet his approval ratings among Americans, while low when compared to other presidents, seem to have scarcely budged throughout his presidency. Do Americans value democracy enough to punish politicians who disregard democratic principles? And specifically, 
What fraction of the U.S. electorate is willing to prioritize democratic principles when the price of doing so is voting against their policy interests or partisan loyalties? Our research suggests the number is lower than you might think. Although, I wonder, what did I think, is one question. And for another thing, I guess it's uh, worth, well, it's definitely worth pondering this question, not just with respect to Trump and what he does, but uh, it puts me in mind a little bit of the concerns that were raised during the filibuster reform fight. Like, won't people be turned off by this idea of changing the rules in the middle of the game, et cetera, et cetera. And well, we even had data at the time that basically suggested eh, people don't pay attention to that kind of rules stuff. And uh, even if it breaks a democratic norm along the way. So, you know, it's well worth figuring out whether this is true, even a uh, aside from Trump. Uh, the next section of the piece uh, describes how they did their research to answer this question. We conducted the following experiment. Rather than asking about support for democracy directly, that would be kind of hard to, to measure, we presented a representative sample of 1,692 U.S. voters recruited through LUCID, whatever that acronym actually is, L-U-C-I-D, and benchmarked against the American National Election Survey with a choice between two hypothetical candidates. Each was described by experimentally assigned attributes typically seen in elections, including their experience, policy proposals, and partisan affiliation. Crucially, a random chose, randomly chosen subset of those candidates were also described as supporting measures that violated a fundamental democratic principle. This does not sound like a terrific experiment, but okay. It's the best they could do. These included violating civil liberties, such as prosecuting journalists who refused to reveal sources. Maybe this isn't so bad after all. I mean, uh, as a design. Uh, at least they get specific about these things. Banning protests by far right or left groups, encroaching on the separation of powers, such as ignoring unfavorable court rulings and governing by executive orders, and undermining fair electoral competition, such as gerrymandering or cutting the number of polling stations in areas that support the other party. For the most part, these undemocratic proposals were modeled on practices that elected incumbents have recently used to undermine democracy around the world as in Hungary, Turkey, and Venezuela. Some of these practices, like gerrymandering and voter suppression, have shown up in the United States. Some of the other ones, too. We then asked our respondents which candidate they would vote for. Based on more than 21,000 candidate choices that respondents made, we can answer a central question about the robustness of American democracy. Are voters willing to punish candidates who violate democratic principles when doing so requires voting against their political ideology, policy priorities, or partisan loyalties? We found a striking fragility in Americans' willingness to defend core democratic values. Overall, candidates who proposed a policy that violated a key democratic principle lost 11% of voters who would have otherwise supported them. To arrive at this figure, we compared two groups of respondents. Those in the control group were choosing between two generic candidates, both of whom held positions perfectly consistent with democratic principles. By contrast, one of the two candidates seen by respondents in the experimental group endorsed a measure that violates a fundamental democratic principle. All other candidate attributes, including policies and party, were randomly assigned and thus balanced across the two groups. The only systematic difference between the control and experimental groups was one candidate's endorsement of an undemocratic position. We can therefore interpret a decline in that candidate's vote share as the voter's punishment for that candidate's disregard of democratic principles. Hmm. I mean, I don't know how else you're going to design this experiment, but as I'm reading through this it occurs to me, like, what would I, what do I think I would do in this situation? And uh, I can't tell whether it's just bias in favor of Democratic candidates or whether, I, you know, whether there's a, a genuine reason for this. I mean, my initial response is, OK, faced with, let's say, a congressional election or even a, a presidential election, as between a Democrat and a Republican, 
where a Democrat has endorsed an anti-democratic small d position like, let's say, I mean, I guess it depends which one it is, right? But if they if they said uh, banning uh, uh, protests by uh, extreme right groups and uh, that's meant to be a uh, a breaking of a democratic norm, do I vote for the Democrat here or not? And the difficulty is that, I mean, each individual position, okay, so it's up against a Republican who hasn't specifically endorsed a, uh, in this hypothetical, hasn't specifically endorsed an anti-democratic position. My worry is, I know what Republicans do, and I know that some other person will probably put to this Republican, should he win a seat in Congress, say, a question that also will, uh, if it's resolved in, in the Republicans' favor, violate a Democratic principle. Do I believe that my Republican candidate here would go along with it despite the spotless record and in this particular contest, putting a spotless record as it comes to principles of democracy up against a besmirched record by the Democrat. In other words, do, I guess the real question is, do I think that the Democrat will be a recidivist and further erode democratic norms later? Do I think that's a one and done? Do I think it's okay because at least we're violating the norms in my favor this time? Or what? And I mean, I guess it's a little bit of all of that possibility. And uh, it's difficult to tell which one is which. It would be extraordinarily difficult for me, given the Republicans' track record on Democratic norms, and particularly their track record, because, again, this assumes both sides equally. While it's absolutely not difficult to imagine how or why a capital D Democratic candidate might endorse an un lowercase d Democratic position. It's not that I have difficulty believing that. It's that I have difficulty believing that in a Republican party that's going to put up a spotless candidate and keep that candidate spotless because Republicans in control of the Congress won't put forward any anti-Democratic proposals for that person to besmirch their record with. I know that's coming, and I'd still probably, all things considered, rather have the Democrat there to cast that vote. Is that my unwillingness to punish a Democrat for breaking democratic norms? Uh, yeah, in some small part and maybe in large part. I just don't know what else to do with it as I, I, I don't find the hypothetical particularly convincing. Maybe it's a little bit easier to decide what to do in the presidential context, but uh, even there, I, I, I don't know. I'm not certain how I would approach this thing. Maybe, or maybe I'm just being described accurately by this experiment as unwilling to uh, punish my, uh, you know, my tribe as... Greg often puts it, although I, I suspect that we should probably try and move away from that language one day, too. Okay, so back to the article. Yes, that 11% who might switch in order to punish somebody might decide an election, but consider who did not abandon the undemocratic candidate. Respondents who felt strongly about policies or partisanship punished undemocratic candidates at lower rates than those with more moderate political loyalties. These differences among voters increased when our hypothetical candidates proposed more extreme liberal and conservative policies. Polarization eroded the public's willingness to defend democracy. And I think that's probably what happened. I'm so worried about what the other side is going to do because I've watched them do it and believe that they'll do it again. And I guess it's, I'm sure that there are Republicans who feel the same about Democrats. And maybe that's exactly it. The polarization eroded the public's willingness to defend democracy. However, I, st I still got to say, uh, if you ask me about it, I still feel like though it happens on both sides, it's worse there. It just seems like that's part and parcel to me of the Republican agenda 
in general is not only to violate those norms, but to say they ought never to have been norms in the first place. That seems worse to me. Maybe I'm wrong. So, where were we? Uh, this was amplified when our respondents identified as either a Democrat or a Republican. Only a fraction of our respondents, those who identified as independents but said they leaned toward one of the two parties, were willing to vote for the other party in large enough numbers to defeat an undemocratic candidate of their own party. Both Democrats and Republicans used a double standard, punishing undemocratic candidates more harshly when they belong to the other party. I think I would do that. Put differently, many Americans appear to be partisans first and small-D Democrats only second. Though I guess, you know, in the hypothetical world of this experiment, I guess I could feel more confident about being dishonest about it and saying, well, if you're telling me that the Republican candidate who has never voted for an undemocratic position will never vote for an undemocratic position from this point forward, then, uh, okay, I guess I feel a little bit better about voting for them, but only because it's a hypothetical. I guess in the real world, I would very likely find myself saying, yeah, that's not actually going to work for me and I, I can't uh, really vote for them. All right. Well, very interesting. We'll continue on with this one. Uh, of course, our first break coming up shortly, but uh, let's see. Let's get into the next section here. What does this mean for American democracy? Big question. When social scientists ask, res ask respondents about the world, about their, uh, around the world, I'm sorry, ask about their attitudes toward democracy, they typically use questions such as, democracy may have problems, but it is the best system of government. Do you agree? Americans systematically respond with some of the highest levels of support for democracy. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue with our reading of uh, the Monkey Cage blog entry on the question of when Trump stretches democratic norms, do voters care? And we learned this at the beginning of the uh, last section of the analysis. And uh, that was that uh, Americans apparently, uh, when asked uh, as uh, compared to others around the world, whether or not they agree with the idea that democracy may have problems, but it's the best system of government. Do you agree? Americans typically respond with some of the highest levels of support for democracy. But our findings suggest, our intrepid political scientists report, that this conventional wisdom may rest on fragile foundations. Instead of asking about support for democracy directly, we inferred citizens' commitment to democratic principles from how they told us they would actually vote. What we found suggests that Americans may value democratic principles, but few will choose those over their partisan loyalties. I can believe it. And when voters place policy and partisanship above democratic principles, why wouldn't politicians? That seems true, too. Recently, Republicans are the ones most often accused of undermining democratic principles for partisan gain, but this may be because Democrats have had few opportunities to do the same. <clears throat> I don't know. Let's see. Uh, well, let's hear what they have to say here. Since 2010, of course, Republicans have controlled most state legislatures and governorships, and few GOP politicians have objected to Trump's incursions against democratic norms. Yet, in our experiment, respondents who identified as Democrats were just as unwilling to abandon their party's candidates as were Republicans, and some Democrats have begun to advocate fighting fire with fire. Hmm. 
And uh, I suppose that it's true. I've seen that. What's their example, though? They have a link to uh, begin advocating fighting fire with fire. It links to a Vox piece by Sean Illing, uh, I guess. Why this political scientist thinks the Democrats have to fight dirty. The Republicans are behaving like a party that believes it will never be held accountable, is I guess the reason. That's also the subheader. And uh, hmm, just sort of curious about exploring that piece. Um, in September 2016, I'm distracting, I'm running away from the other article, but I'm curious. In September 2016, an anonymous conservative writer published an essay called The Flight 93 Election. The reference title was a reference to the one hijacked flight on 9-11 that didn't reach its destination because passengers overwhelmed the hijackers and brought the plane down. The logic of the essay was simple enough. The prospect of a Hillary Clinton presidency was so positively ruinous that conservatives had no choice but to support Donald Trump, no matter how awful or incompetent he appeared to be. The stakes were simply too high. Imagine that. Until now, there was no left-wing equivalent to the Flight 93 essay, no rallying cry that urged Democrats and liberals to do whatever is necessary to win. But David Farris's new book, It's Time to Fight Dirty, is the closest anyone has come so far. Interesting. And I guess at this point we'll pause in the reading of this story just to say, all right, I get the idea. But again, uh, I guess I would say uh, all the political scientists in this initial study are saying is that uh, if you hypothetically ask about democratic norm breaking, people tend to ignore it and stay home with their political party anyway. And I don't know whether that's, and we can't be sure whether that's simple partisanship or objective observation in that uh, Republicans, as they say, are the ones who have had the only real opportunities to break democratic norms, given the political situation in the run-up to at least to these this latest round of elections. Um, but that also means that we have an objective reality in which we have observed Republicans doing it and Democrats not doing it. Now, it may be the case that Democrats may get just as bad one day, but they haven't. And you have to imagine that they will or that they have in this hypothetical in order to approach the question fairly. And I'm not certain that that's entirely possible. And I don't know even whether it's really without basis to say Republicans do it more frequently, uh, more flagrantly and with more damaging results than uh, anything Democrats have to date, even before, uh, in the old days when they dominated Congress and state legislatures, uh, it just didn't happen to this extent. I don't, you know, I, I'm having difficulty with the control procedures in this experiment. But okay, let's continue on on the uh, the reading. We left off just after they said, okay, well, some Democrats have begun to advocate fighting fire with fire. There's just one more paragraph left. I should have just plowed through. Such a strategy risks undermining the legitimacy of the democratic process. This is true, but we've known this. The month's events indicate that the toughest tests of American democratic foundations under the Trump presidency may be ahead when partisans on both sides believe they must disregard democratic principles because that's what the other side is doing. The norms that democracies depend on, including the respect for election results, may be in danger. That is true. Uh, though, again, I still have to object, and maybe it's just my bias talking, but if one side is threatening, we will throw out the election results and start a civil war, and the other side is saying, well, we'll pack the Supreme Court. I don't know that they are equivalent. You know, like, do I vote for Democrats who say, let's start a civil war? Uh, probably not, although do I vote for Republicans? who are also saying they'll start a civil war? Uh, no. What do I do in that case? I'm not really sure. If they're legitimately talking about, I have one congressional candidate to vote for, a Democrat running here who says, I am definitely pro-civil war. I don't know how good I feel about casting that vote. I'm not sure what I do with it. 
but uh, I would at least have pause. But since that's not actually happening, and very often the Republicans are saying, we're going to have a civil war. I'm not saying I advocated. I'm just saying it's going to come to that. And the other side is saying, you know, we may have to think about expanding the size of the Supreme Court. I just, uh, you know, is it a breaking of a democratic norm? Sure. Is it less offensive than saying, golly, if I don't get my way, I'm going to have civil war. Yeah, it is. And I don't know whether they have adequately controlled for that here. So, okay. It's, it's an interesting question and it makes you think and that's always worth doing but not for very long okay we'll move on to a couple of other issues and round up a couple other interesting things that i think you may want to hear about uh although maybe just for a second should we uh should we indulge the question of whether it's time to fight dirty that's not irrelevant to what we're talking about it's old ancient october 7th 2018 and it ends up being an interview with uh, between Sean Illing, our, uh, our our writer here, and what's the guy's name? David Farris, the author of the book "It's Time to Fight Dirty." Let's let's take a look. Farris, a political scientist at Roosevelt University, argues that the Democratic Party must recognize that Republicans aren't engaged in a policy fight; instead, they're waging a procedural war. Hmm. Okay, or constitutional hardball depending on your preferred term. What he means is that Republicans have spent the past two decades exploiting the vagueness of the Constitution, yes, hardball, to create structural advantages for their side, passing discriminatory voter ID laws, using the census to gerrymander districts, blocking Democratic Supreme Court nominees, and so on. Farris writes, Democrats have to recognize this reality and act accordingly, especially now that the Republicans are poised to conquer the Supreme Court for a generation. I reached out to him to find out what exactly he has in mind. A lightly edited transcript of our conversation follows. And it goes like this. Sean Ailing begins things. Your book feels like the left-wing equivalent of the Flight 93 essay, an urgent democratic call to arms. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I think so. We're at a very dangerous moment in American history. There's been a massive erosion of trust in public institutions and in the broader electoral uh, process, the Trump administration has been disastrously disruptive to the norms of our political culture. We're also in a very dangerous moment for the planet, and I worry that we're sleepwalking into a series of crises that we'll have to deal with for a very long time, that our kids will have to deal with for a very long time. So yes, I am sort of sounding the alarm, and I think Democrats have to recognize the urgency of the moment and act accordingly. Am I in charge of the cockpit or am I rather am I in charge the cockpit or die mode? I was wondering whether he really was familiar with the Flight 93 essay or not. I guess maybe or he gets the idea anyway. So is he in charge the cockpit or die mode? I don't know. And there's your answer right there. No, he's not, obviously. Uh, Otherwise, he'd say so. I don't know, but I do think our predicament justifies some serious procedural hardball from the Democrats. There's the, there, it's a quantifiable difference. Do I believe that switching my vote to punish a transgressor on the Democratic side results in less transgression, period? And the answer is no, I don't. Not because I don't believe that Democrats ought to be held accountable for their transgressions. I guess I wish that there was a way to do that, but just that I believe that the transgressions will continue and be that much worse with Republicans in charge. And I'll end up regretting my vote and I will wish for the less flagrant transact, uh, tra- uh, what would I say? I, I already, uh, transgression. I lost my train of thought on the trans words here. Uh, I, I think it would be, a, I'll end up regretting that I gave Republicans more power. I'm fairly certain of that. So Illing, Continues with the next question. Well, let's talk about the Democrats. There are roughly three competing visions within the party about how to move forward. One, go the way of Bernie Sanders and appeal to working class voters with progressive policy ideas. Two, go to the go the centrist route and in, in a bid to grab moderate suburban independents and Republicans who might have voted for Trump but can be persuaded to jump ship. Or three, double down on the 2008 and 2012 strategies and hope to recreate the Obama coalition of women, minorities, and young people. You say all these are non-starters. Why? 
Okay. David Ferris answers, I think Democrats should have this debate, but my point is that no policy platform is going to win three or four consecutive national elections for Democrats because we know policy isn't what decides elections. That's not how most voters make decisions. So there are no policy changes that are going to reverse the overall trajectory that this society is on right now. We have to address some of the structural barriers to progressive power in this country, and we need to take those things as seriously as we do the policy fights within the party. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Agree? Disagree? Don't know yet. Got to hear more. Sean Ellings says, I definitely want to get into some of these structural barriers, but... Let's be clear about this point you're making. A lot of people still think there's some meaningful connection between policy outcomes and voter decisions, but there's a good bit of political science research to suggest that's just a fantasy. And Farris answers, right. People just don't seem to make the connection between policies and the party in power. And that's quite often true. In fact, maybe that gives us an idea of where we can go next. So, for example... The Democrats passed Obamacare and gave millions of people health care, and yet tons of people who benefited from it have no idea what it is or how they benefited. And it's like that with a lot of policies. Voters simply don't connect the dots, and so they reward or punish the wrong party. And this can be at work inside of a party, too. Perhaps that's where we'll go next. I think the idea that we're going to deliver these benefits to people and they're going to be like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everything that you've done. Let me return you with a larger majority next time. Is just nonsense. It's the wrong way to think about politics. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do things for people, but we've got to be serious about how elections are won and they're not being won on the basis of policy proposals or policy wins. Hmm. Sean then asks, in the book... You say that Democrats are engaged in policy fights and Republicans are waging a procedural war. What does that mean? Uh, hmm, interesting question, although uh, I think I know the answer to that one. I'm actually put in mind of something that I, I think we want to interject at this point. It's he, he makes a good point, Ferris. But of course, why do you want to win? I mean, we figured we know we we want to win, but let's put our finger on it. Why do we want to win? And the answer is policy reasons. That might not be what we campaign on, but I don't know. I mean, it kind of we're still stuck with it, right? We want things to go our way, don't we? Therefore, we want to win. Which comes first here, wanting to win or you know wanting a policy? achievement and it's hard to separate it's not that easy i guess i should say to separate the two but all right let's proceed with the question he's asked him uh what uh what's going on here the we uh you say democrats are engaged in policy fights republicans are waging a procedural war what does that mean that's an easier question to answer and he does the constitution is a shockingly short document And it turns out that it's extremely vague on some key procedures that we rely on to help government function at a basic level. For the government to work, cooperation between parties is needed, but when that cooperation is withdrawn, it creates chaos. Since the 1990s, when Newt Gingrich took over Congress, we've seen a one-sided escalation in which Republicans exploit the vagueness or lack of clarity in the Constitution in order to press their advantage in a variety of arenas, from voter ID laws to gerrymandering, to behavioral norms in the Congress and Senate. And Sean asks, What the Republicans did to Merrick Garland was one of the most egregious examples I've ever seen. And the answer, right. They essentially stole a seat on the Supreme Court, a swing seat, no less, but they correctly argued that they had no clear constitutional obligation to consider the president's nominee for the seat. They didn't violate the Constitution. They violated the spirit of the Constitution. They violated the norms that have allowed these institutions to function normally for years and years. This is the sort of maneuvering and procedural warfare I'm talking about, and the Republicans have been escalating it for two decades, and they've managed to entrench their power through these dubious procedures. The result is that the structural environment is biased against Democrats, and the Republicans have engineered it that way. Sean then asks, Let's dive into some of your proposed solutions. For starters, you think Democrats should break California up into seven states. Why? 
Okay, uh, the Senate. I guess. I don't think the architects of the Constitution understood that population dynamics would create a state like California with 38 million people and then a bunch of states like the Dakotas and Wyoming and Vermont and Delaware that have very small populations. They certainly knew the difference, obviously, between large and small populations and large and small states, but I don't think they knew about the extremes as between California and Wyoming, for instance. The end result is that voters in California and New York and Texas are systematically disadvantaged in national policy relative to their counterparts in small rural states. It's absurd that California and Delaware should have the same number of senators. Given the current system, Democratic-leaning states, which contain far more people, are rarely going to be represented in the Senate. That's not fair or Democratic, and we shouldn't accept it, especially with the current horror show that in the White House. Uh, Sean then says it's extremely unlikely that this will ever happen, but tell me how it would play out if it did. To which I guess he forced to ask why a little bit, but okay. Technically, from a constitutional standpoint, all it would require is an act of the California state legislature signed by the governor of California and then accepted by Congress. That's the hard part. So here's what needs to happen. A referendum on breaking a state up into smaller states passes, and then it's validated by the state legislature, and then the governor who would obviously need to be a Democrat, signs it. And finally, a Democrat-controlled Congress makes it official. This is not as crazy an idea as people think. There have been several attempts to do it in California already, and you can make a pretty strong argument that the state is far too large to be ruled from Sacramento. And if Californians manage to pull it off, we'd likely have another 12 Democratic senators in Washington, or at least more than we have now, more electoral college votes, too. Probably true. Sean and says, tell me about something, some other dirty tactics that you recommend in this book. And then Ferris responds, I think they should grant statehood to D.C. and Puerto Rico. Both states have held referenda that endorse statehood. We have millions of Americans right now who have no representation in Congress. To me, it's just unquestionably the right thing to do should grant people the representation they want and deserve, and it just happens that doing so would almost certainly send four more Democrats into the Senate and probably an all-Democratic congressional delegation from Puerto Rico, too. Sean then asks, uh, you also think the Democrats should kill the filibuster, right? Yeah, I think they should eliminate the filibuster in the first month of the next Democratic administration, if it even survives that long. I think it's another anti-Democratic procedure in the Senate. We already have a constitutional framework that's deliberately difficult to work around to get policy change. And then you add a supermajority requirement in one of the two national legislatures. It's just bananas. There's no other country on the face of the earth that has a supermajority requirement to make routine legislation. I guess you better fact check that. But okay. Uh, Sean then says, you write as well that Democrats should start packing the courts with as many left-leaning judges as possible. And David says, the Constitution doesn't say how many of the Supreme Court justices we should have. We know this. And we have not always had nine. And we know that, too. Up until the mid-19th century, it was routine for the number of justices to be changed based on the whims of Congress. So it's not unprecedented. The way I look at it, Democrats have won the popular vote in six of the last seven presidential elections. I went back and added up all the votes for the U.S. Senate since 1992, and Democrats have won 30 million more votes over that time period. I think the American people have pretty clearly expressed their desire to have Democrats staff the federal judiciary, and yet, due to the Republicans' procedural tactics, they've not been able to do that. Sean says this is another one of those areas where you think the Democrats really have no choice but to play hardball because Republicans are already doing it and, in any case, are going to continue doing it. Answer, the Republicans are already fighting court wars and they're winning. Obviously, the Merrick Garland story speaks for itself, but they also held up Obama's judicial nominees throughout his entire term in office including hardly allowing him to appoint anyone to the federal courts in his last few years after they took the Senate. So yeah, we've got to play hardball, and there are other things we could do that might be less inflammatory, like amending the Constitution to eliminate lifetime tenure on the courts. That might actually lower the temperature around this issue 
and make the stakes for presidential elections a little less existential. Sean's next question. I don't really disagree with your logic, but doesn't this spiral of norm violating give you pause? I get that this is a war Republicans are already waging and it's near suicidal for Democrats to ignore that, but I wonder what the end game is here. This happens to be the last question here. Farris answers, we're in the midst of a slow motion unraveling of democracy in this country. If we don't return the favor with some of this procedural war stuff, the only other option is to continue watching the other side do it. That's not an acceptable option in my opinion. I'm okay with that. I don't think we can restore order by respecting rules that are not respected by Republicans. I do believe we'll have to find a way to end this procedural war at some point, but now is not that time. Republicans need to know what it's like to be on the other end of normative violations. The Republicans are behaving like a party that believes it will never be held accountable for anything they're doing, and so far they haven't been. That has to change before we can fix this mess. Well, that may very well be true. It's certainly the case. I've certainly argued it in the past in the context of filibuster reform, among other things, that uh, it just can't be the case that rules, laws, norms are for Democrats and anything goes for Republicans. That can't continue. All right. So in the last piece, the uh, Vox interview with David Ferris, there was a moment in there where I realized, oh, there's something I want to cover next. And although we're inching up on the next break, I thought we could at least get it started. There was a portion of the interview in which David Ferris said uh, that people don't seem to make the connection between policies and the party in power. And I said that this is probably a dynamic that even can apply intra-party. And what I had in mind was, of course, uh, the current leadership fight over uh, the speakership in the House of Representatives. And uh, I, I've just been uh, <clears throat> I've been running into so many examples of uh, places or issues about which people have come away with vague, generalized impressions about Nancy Pelosi, about her style of leadership, about her policy preferences that aren't necessarily guided by facts, although, you know, there's always facts on uh, on both sides, unfortunately, that you can use, yeah, you can, you can argue them and bend them to the benefit of one side or another. But for instance, I would run into a lot of people that were frustrated at uh, the inability to pass a more liberal, more progressive Affordable Care Act. And... Although, you know, they have certainly been confronted with the uh, argument that that was largely the doing of the Senate. Uh, They were either convinced that Nancy Pelosi could have led the House in a more aggressive posture against the Senate or whatever, or perhaps they do misunderstand the facts. That's entirely possible, too. Or they just disagree with some other aspect of her preferred policy position or leadership style, and they disagree with it legitimately. Uh, but, uh, you know, that her position represents a, uh, a necessary compromise, perhaps. So, you know, not everybody agrees on what's a necessary compromise. But I thought it was interesting that this kept coming up. And it reminded me of a piece that we have waiting in the wings from Ryan Grimm, written over at The Intercept, of course. And maybe you saw this one. And uh, again, because we're coming up on the break, we'll try and tease the start of it for you. But maybe you saw Nancy Pelosi's fight, how she revived Obamacare after Democrats left it for dead. And that should uh, give the progressive side of whatever remains to the progressive opposition, I guess, to her speakership, some pause and some context in which to consider what she really did in getting the Affordable Care Act passed. And look, you know, it was far from perfect. And there are a lot of people who had a lot of complaints about it being a warmed over uh, Heritage Foundation plan, which it was, of course. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, it saved a lot of lives, quite honestly. And you ought to be recognized for that. And uh, maybe that has something to do with the fact that pieces like this may have something to do 
with the fact that the opposition on the left continues, I think, to erode, to fall away and to find ways of reconciling themselves with the Pelosi candidacy, whereas those who oppose her from the right have pretty much been sticking to their guns. There's just not a whole lot of them. But let's tease you with the first paragraph or two before we exit out of here in a minute or two. Uh, Barack Obama's great strength, Ryan begins, was always his ability to shape himself into a vessel for the hopes of a wide array of different people. For Nancy Pelosi, it's been the reverse. As she manages to become a symbol of the varying fears of the, op- of the opposing factions of the Democratic Party. Hmm. Interesting way of putting it. For the party's left, she's too tied to big money and the corporate PAC model of fundraising. I do hear that complaint. Uh, for And, and uh, embraces a pay-go politics of austerity. Mm, that's, uh, well, she does seem to want to stick by the pay-go. And uh, that's inexplicable otherwise. For the party's right, She's a spend-happy San Francisco liberal whose presence at the top puts the new majority at risk. And that, I think, most of us agree is just a horrible criticism and just one of those ones that's just unworthy of further consideration. The legend of Pelosi has it that after raising her five children, this stay-at-home mom decided to throw herself into politics and thus was born the first woman speaker of the House in U.S. history. The impressive feat of child-rearing is accurate, but the rest leaves a lot out. And onto that blank page, foes have been all too happy to write their own stories of Pelosi. We'll be back after a minute or so to try and investigate what some of those stories are. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Edwards Radio. Let's uh, continue then with Ryan Grimm's piece in The Intercept. And I don't have to scroll too far back to get that title for you. Nancy Pelosi's fight, how she revived Obamacare after Democrats left it for dead. We left off by uh, pointing out that there was the myth of Pelosi, but that the myth left a lot out. And onto that blank page, foes have been all too happy to write their own stories of Pelosi. Pelosi's confounding image is built on her unique political foundation. It's true that she did not enter elected public office in, uh, did not enter elected public office in 1987 until she had finished raising her five children, but she was by no means new to politics. That's certainly true. Democratic Representative Phil Burton, upon seeing the San Francisco mansion she shared with her husband, investor Paul Pelosi, noted that it would make a tremendous location for political fundraisers. Pelosi, it turned out, had a gift for just that, and her fundraising prowess would eventually turn her into a power center in California politics in her own right. In 1976, more than a decade before entering Congress, she was elected as a member of the Democratic National Committee. Over the next five years, she would become chair of the Northern California Democratic Party and then the statewide Democratic Party. In 1985, she lost a bid for DNC chair. Burton, who served in Congress for 19 years, was a transformative political figure both in California and in the education of Pelosi. Labor reporter Harold Meyerson once called him the single most important member of the House of Representatives in the 60s and 70s. Pelosi is often lauded for her uncanny ability to count votes, something that was also said repeatedly of Burton. He was a role model for Pelosi, someone who was enthusiastic about fundraising and took politics seriously, rather than a purist who stood aloof from what many on the left saw as a corrupt endeavor. I'm a fighting liberal, Burton would famously say. His biographer, John Jacobs, agreed. A ruthless and unabashed progressive, Burton terrified his opponents, ran over his friends, forged improbable coalitions, and from 1964 to 1983 became one of the most influential representatives in the House. He also acquired more raw power than almost any left liberal politician ever had. Fighting meant getting your hands dirty. Burton pioneered gerrymandering in California. My contribution to modern art, he called it. He even drew a district so that his brother John could have a house seat too, and began what is now a common practice of spreading PAC money around to colleagues in tough races in order to build power within the caucus. Where have you heard that described before? 
He helped shape the House floor process so that lobbyists would have more ability to tweak individual pieces of legislation, uncorking contributions from K Street and helping to create the Washington ecosystem we know today, and which I'm sure almost none of us actually love. And that's the point of laying this out. Burton encouraged Pelosi to run in one of the new districts he had drawn, but she demurred. First elected in 1964, he took on the power of the Southern Bulls, who had used seniority and one-party rule in the South to lock down control of key committee chairpersonships. The sooner the party could crush its Dixiecrat wing, he argued, the better. Sounds good, right? Burton organized his liberal colleagues and reformed the process for selecting chairs replacing it with a secret vote, which was the beginning of the end of Southern dominance of the House Democratic Caucus. In 1976, he fell one vote short in a bid for majority leader. In Pelosi, Burton had a ready student. If your knowledge of Pelosi comes from Republican attack ads, you know her as a San Francisco liberal or even radical. But she was raised in Maryland by her father, Thomas D'Alessandro Jr. Sorry, I mangled the name, and it's not even a hard one for me. The boss of the Baltimore political machine, who was by turns a congressman and mayor of Charm City, Del Alessandro's operation, like most big city machines of the era, although <laughs> typo here, says most big city machines of the ear, which gets past your spell check, but is still wrong and uh, can trip you up if you're not watching. Okay, so like most big city machines of the era, it was linked in public to local mafia figures, according to his FBI file. And uh, they have it right there. It was a lousy time. Burton rightly saw in Pelosi that rarest of breeds, a liberal born to fight. In Burton, Pelosi found someone who knew how to make progressive change actually happen. His list of legislative achievements was long. Supplemental security income a higher minimum wage, compensation for black lung, food stamps for striking workers, the abolition of the House Un-American Affairs Committee, despite, or in part, because of his legendary ruthlessness and rage. John Burton, Phil's brother and himself a former congressman, said that Phil never quite mentored Pelosi. I mean, Christ, this is a woman who was brought up in Baltimore politics. He wasn't working with some neophyte that all of a sudden he had to explain, well, here's how it works. They got along because even though she was an amateur at that time, she was still a pro. Burton told the author Vincent Bizdek, good luck pronouncing that, B-Z-D-E-K, how about that, for the book Woman of the House. He acknowledged, though, that Phil helped hone her skills. Pelosi said that her Baltimore education made Burton easy to handle. Actually, my family really prepared me for Phil Burton. One of the reasons I got along with Phil is because I wasn't afraid of him. I knew a lot of people like him, she told Bizdek. In April 1983, at the age of 56, he died of a heart attack. His wife, Sala Burton, won the special election to replace him, but four years later, she lay dying herself and made a parting deathbed endorsement. Nancy. The nod helped, and Pelosi won the special election in 1987 to represent the Burton's San Francisco district. She ran on the prophetic and on-brand slogan, A Voice That Will Be Heard, brought with her the conviction that effective fundraising was the key to building power, and that without power, she couldn't enact her agenda. Ah, sounds familiar. By 2002, she'd become the first progressive in a generation elected to leadership, serving as minority whip. When Democratic leader Dick Gephardt stepped down, she became minority leader, using the position to rally her caucus against the war in Iraq. Pelosi would become the first female Speaker of the House after the Democrats took the House majority back in 2006, got the opportunity to go big and fulfill a century-long liberal dream after Obama's 2008 election, but it almost fell apart. The train wreck that nearly derailed the Affordable Care Act in 2009 and 2010 was visible from miles away. Michael Capuano, a congressman from eastern Massachusetts, saw it coming. When Massachusetts Senator Ted Kennedy died in August of 2009 of brain cancer, his passing created a vacancy that was filled by Paul Kirk, a longtime Kennedy aide appointed as a placeholder while a special election was organized. 
Coincidentally, it was Kirk who had beaten Pelosi in the 1985 DNC chair race. How do you like that? On December 24th, 2009, Kirk cast the 60th vote to break the filibuster and pass the Senate version of the Affordable Care Act, a slightly more corporate-friendly plan than the one that had been passed in the House on November 7th. That bill, shepherded through by Pelosi, included, yes, remember, included a public health insurance option to compete with private plans in the marketplaces that would be created by Obamacare. It was not the more robust version of the public option that the Congressional Progressive Caucus had pushed for, but the bill was broadly considered more aggressive, and the two chambers planned to hash out their differences in a conference committee. Two weeks earlier, Democrats had held a Senate primary contest pitting Capuano against Attorney General Martha Coakley. Former President Bill Clinton, Emily's List, and other party leaders got behind Coakley, the only statewide official in the race she easily dispatched of Capuano in the December primary. They said that women don't have much luck in Massachusetts politics, she declared at her party that night, and we believed that it was quite possible that the luck was about to change. Assured of victory in the coming January general election, she tried that luck and departed for a two-week vacation in the Caribbean. Yet Capuano returned to Washington, shaken by what he'd seen on the campaign trail. He was invited to brief a private gathering of House Democrats in the basement of the Capitol. He leaned into a standing microphone, looked around the room at his colleagues, and, according to one of the lawmakers present, delivered a two-word speech. You're screwed. Yikes. As the gathered House Democrats gradually realized they had heard the extent of his speech, The silence was punctuated only by soft, nervous laughter. Later, Capuano elaborated on the theme. Everywhere he went in Massachusetts, he said he met people who were absolutely livid at the anemic approach to job creation in the wake of the crisis. That rage, he warned, was going to be turned against Democrats at the polls if they didn't deliver. Coakley, still on the beach, saw it too late. In January 2010, Scott Brown, the butt of jokes for his nude Cosmo centerfold, delivered a stunning upset depriving Democrats of their 60-vote supermajority. That meant that any bill that would emerge from conference committee would need at least one Republican to support it, or Democrats would have to nuke the filibuster. Neither possibility appeared likely, and the fate of the bill was suddenly in doubt. Democrats, including Pelosi ally Representative Barney Frank of Massachusetts, began writing its obituary. Offered Frank, I feel strongly that the Democratic majority in Congress must respect the process and make no effort to bypass the electoral results. If Martha Coakley had won, I believe we could have worked out a reasonable compromise between the House and the Senate health care bills. But since Scott Brown has won and the Republicans now have 41 votes in the Senate, That approach is no longer appropriate. I am hopeful that some Republican senators will be willing to discuss a revised version of health care reform because I do not think that the country would be well served by the health care status quo. But our respect for democratic procedures must rule out any effort to pass a health care bill as if the Massachusetts election had not happened. Going forward, I hope there will be a serious effort to change the Senate rule, which means that 59 are not enough to pass major legislation, but those are the rules by which the health care bill was considered, and it would be wrong to change them in the middle of this process. And as much of a fighter as Barney Frank was, man, looking back on that uh, is uh, painful to to see, especially um, that I don't recall him being a particularly vocal supporter of changing the filibuster rules when we finally did get around to it. Uh, at any rate, um, that certainly looks a lot different in the wake of having read the uh, interview with David Farris about the need for f- at least fighting a little harder, if not necessarily dirty, in the realm of constitutional hardball. And yet, there you have it. I mean, he there nobody disputes Barney Frank's status as a liberal, and yet. 
we have this situation where he's saying, look, this thing is over. We're not going to be able to, you know, we can't, we can't pass this bill. We tried, we lost, we failed, it's too bad, but uh, we'll come back and fight another day. Nancy Pelosi says, I, I think we might be able to engineer this thing with a little constitutional hardball. And it wasn't even all that constitutional, to be honest. Okay. So continuing on, if Coakley loses, it's over, said Representative Karen, uh, Carolyn Maloney, Democrat of New York, before the votes were tallied. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, facing his own reelection, was inclined to back burner the Affordable Care Act with New York Senator Charles Schumer, the number three Democrat in the Senate at the time, urging him to move to a jobs bill. But and it wouldn't have been a terrible idea considering what Capuano had to say about uh, anger in Massachusetts. But even on election night, there was at least one politician who wasn't giving up. We don't say a state that already has health care should determine whether the rest of the country should, Pelosi said. That's a good point. They're not fighting necessarily on health care, on the question of health care in Massachusetts, because it had been taken care of, of course, by, uh, oh, Romney care. Yeah, the same thing. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, well, okay, that whole debate aside... Uh, that's true. Well, no wonder they were focusing on something else in Massachusetts. The health care issue had largely been, uh, well, if not solved, had been addressed anyway, uh, even if they weren't terribly happy with the results. But that's a good point. We don't say a state that already has health care should determine whether the rest of the country should, Pelosi said. We will get the job done. I'm very confident. I've always been confident. And that went way against the conventional wisdom at the time you just might have forgotten along the way the reaction from the white house chief of staff uh rahm emanuel had been the opposite and he began pushing to back off the affordable care act and instead do piecemeal reform focused largely on expanding care for children the white house obama included began sending mixed signals about whether it wanted to go big or small with Obama endorsing a plan that included the core elements of reform. I would advise that we try to move quickly to coalesce around those elements of the package that people agree on, Obama said in one interview. Pelosi, in a conference call later that month with House leadership, dubbed Emanuel an incrementalist and mocked the small ball idea as kitty care. Hee <laughs> hee. The House would be going big, she said. To do it, the lower chamber would pass the version of the ACA that had already moved through the Senate. And the Senate would use the reconciliation process, which requires just 50 votes, but is only available for legislation that impacts the budget, in order to make some changes to the original bill. I hope you remember that part of the mechanics. I was a mid-level staffer on the Hill during the original ACA fight, I vividly remember the feeling on Capitol Hill the week after Scott Brown won. Suddenly the wheels were coming off. People were talking about scuttling a major bill and doing something piecemeal, recalled Ezra Levin, who would later become a co-founder of Indivisible, a progressive political organization. He said that he and his eventual co-founder, Leah Greenberg, also a Hill staffer at the time, drafted an op-ed they never published since Pelosi's push made the issue moot. The unpublished piece argued that, quote, abandoning the ACA would turn off millennial idealists like us, did they really use the term millennials even back then, from the possibilities of politics. Why work in government, policy, and politics if the result of a generational win like 2008 resulted in barely anything at all? But Pelosi saved it. She demonstrated serious leadership at a time of real uncertainty. It was, corny as it sounds, inspirational. And tens of millions of Americans got health insurance as a result of that leadership in that moment. The Affordable Care Act, even the House-passed version, was a flawed piece of legislation for a host of reasons. Some that can be laid at Pelosi's feet and some that can't. But as an act of legislative prowess... Her revival of it remains a signature accomplishment. 
Just ahead of the final vote, Pelosi sat down with progressive reporters and bloggers for a last pre-passage interview. She relished her victory over Emanuel and the incrementalists. My biggest fight was against those who wanted to do something incremental versus those who wanted to do something comprehensive. We have won that, she said proudly. In our midst, there's the small bill crowd here, she said, referring to the Capitol, then added, gesturing out the window behind her, where Pennsylvania Avenue stretched to the White House, and there. And at this point, the piece is punctuated with the embedded tweets of Leah Greenberg saying, uh, it's honestly bizarre to see people trying to rewrite 2010 to make Pelosi anything less than the hero of the ACA fight. Moderate Dems freaked out after Scott Brown won and tried to run for the exits. Pelosi put her foot down and made the thing happen. Was the ACA perfect? Obviously not. But blame Joe Lieberman and the other D senators who watered it down for that. Pelosi fought for the progressive version of the bill and rallied her caucus to get it across the finish line. Quite simply, it would not have happened without her. Moving back to uh, Ryan's piece here. Effective machine politics are built on rewarding loyalty, punishing betrayal, and a long memory. The tactics translate as well to the House of Representatives as they do anywhere. No one's a better vote counter than Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi, quipped Representative Hakeem Jeffries, a Democrat of New York, on Friday. His name keeps coming up in these contests. I don't know whether he's actually uh, interested or just having his name put forward because everybody figures... uh, well, person of color and uh, not a white guy, so we can put him up for us. I think that's a lot of what's going on on that side. But, uh, I don't know, there may be some genuine interest. Who's I, I haven't talked to him. I haven't heard from him. He's not going to tell me. Anyway, she coupled that understanding of machine politics with the fundraising skills she honed in California and the eye-popping sum of more than $100 million that she raised for the 2018 cycle helped propel Democrats into the majority. And I have told you time and again what that ordinarily means in our contests for leadership. And by the way, I guess I might as well reiterate somewhere along the line, I'm not opposed to changing that model. I just find it descriptive. I don't know if I would say that's something we ought to be aspiring to maintain. It's just pretty predictive because that's the kind of transactional people who are casting votes in the leadership races. That's just the way it is. All right. Her focus on big money contained the seeds of her own political growth away from the left. Or, put another way, as the left developed a sophisticated critique of money and politics and set about building an alternative small-dollar fundraising infrastructure, Pelosi has stayed moored to big money the way she knows best. The extra dose of irony is that she has always used her legislative skill to push hard on campaign finance reforms. If she becomes Speaker, H.R. 1 will be a sweeping set of reforms that includes matching federal funds for small contributions, legislation that, if it someday becomes law, could radically reshape the political landscape. Yet, headed into 2019, she has already begun handcuffing a populist agenda and has proposed a rule called PAYGO, or pay-as-you-go for a longer name, uh, that any new spending would need to be offset by tax hikes or spending cuts elsewhere. And she has put forward another rule that would require a three-fifths vote for any legislation that increased taxes on the bottom 80% of earners, a proposal that would rule out a wide swath of policies aimed at reducing inequality. Meanwhile, she has taken to ridiculing the push to abolish immigration and customs enforcement, ICE, of course, and is far from an ally in the fight for Medicare for all, urging Democrats instead to focus on reducing drug prices or making health care more affordable, the kind of incremental politics she rightly belittled in 2010. Yet, as she is rocked by a rebellion from her right, she has moved closer to the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which she co-founded with Senator Bernie Sanders, 
back in 1991. Oh my. Last week, she cut a deal with the leaders of the caucus that will give progressives proportional representation on so-called money committees, prime slots that have long been reserved for moderate, business-friendly Democrats who use their position on the panel to raise money from the industries under its jurisdiction. Agreeing to such a move was a break from her general mode of operating, although I tend to disagree, which warns that such unilateral disarmament in the fundraising game only plays into Republican hands. That part she is departing from, and I agree. Uh, where I disagree is that she has been uh, lax in moving newer, more recently elected and younger members into those money committees. I think she's been extraordinarily active in that as compared to previous leaders, both Democratic and Republican, I would say. Is it enough? No, clearly not. And especially not when you get a large class of incoming uh, new members. But uh, it, is it better than it ever has been under any other leadership? Yeah, it is. I've watched it. Uh, there's been some uh, disputing over whether or not it's sufficient or whether it's even meaningful at all. And if I can, uh, maybe I'll use the break to dig up an interesting exchange, eh, partial exchange anyway, that I had on Twitter that makes some good points, uh, but I still think is overcome by her record if you really give a a good, hard, and honest look at what she's done for new and incoming members. Where, I mean, it used to just be, it was out of the question that a new member would be considered for one of the exclusive committees. That just was not done ever, period, end of sentence. Republicans have begun doing it since Pelosi began doing it in 2006 and beyond, after the 2006 elections. But before that, no, never. It just wasn't done. It didn't happen. It may be, although now that I think about it, it may be that uh, following the Gingrich victories, because they had such an enormous new class of Republican members, I think they did have to end up sticking one or two members into something exclusive somewhere. But uh, I'm not even positive that that's the case, and it certainly didn't happen in great numbers. It, wasn't a, it didn't appear to be a conscious strategy of, of integrating new members into leadership positions so much as it was, we have to put these people somewhere. They had something like 70 new members to deal with. Anyway, uh, we can wind up this piece if we only concentrate in, on our task here. Uh, we had just said agreeing to such a move was a break from her general mode of operating. I disagreed a little bit, but here, placing vulnerable moderates in such plum spots to help them fill their war chests is a move that Burton would have appreciated, yet stacking those committees with progressives who will write tougher legislation would be likely to have made him smile too. With Pelosi, as it was with Burton, it's complicated. But this liberal isn't going down without a fight. And that's, uh, well, there you have it. It's pretty damn true. And uh, it shouldn't surprise you that things are a little bit more complicated than perhaps uh, the black and white version of the leadership contest would have you believe. All right, let's see. Where will I find... I'm going to have to uh, spend a little time digging in my, um, in my uh, responses in Twitter to find the exchange I had with somebody who was, uh, well, really dead set in their opposition to... Pelo well, not so much to Pelosi continuing by itself, but the entirety of the existing House Democratic leadership without some kind of shake-up or change, uh, really bothered them. That was uh, something that uh, they wanted to see happen, wanted to see change, uh, not just because they were being ageist about it necessarily, but uh, also because they felt that uh, the, 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 the ability to raise money, I mean, this is sort of a chicken and egg thing, the ability to raise money in a leadership position tended to perpetuate their continuance in leadership positions and uh, I guess to no one's surprise uh, enabled them to raise the money that made it possible to continue in leadership positions and that it might be worth our time to think about 
Well, the, the difficulty I had in considering their proposal was that they were just basically saying we ought to just put a new member in one of these top leadership spots that are elective, and it just doesn't work like that. It's a great idea. It just didn't happen that way. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGO in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of KGO in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching KGRO X or David Waldman or KGRO in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, I mentioned to you that there was an exchange that I had had on Twitter about the subject of the leadership, and uh, it came out of uh, a note I appended to Ben Wickler's uh, tweet. I was a little bit surprised to see this one from Ben Wickler, who is, of course, uh, what do they say, the director of Move On here in Washington. And I, I, I guess in hindsight, I'm not quite sure exactly whether he yeah I, i'm not 100 percent where sure where he was coming from with this one uh, he's a pelosi supporter of course and was pointing out for instance uh what he had grabbed onto uh oh, what am i looking at here uh if i can open his tweet yeah then i should be able to see this one um he's uh including i guess the press release from Mark Pokan and uh, Pramila Jayapal, Jayapal, who were announcing um, a, uh, I guess what they thought was a, a, well, it's certainly an accomplishment. Maybe they thought it was a concession from Pelosi about putting newly elected members of Congress, particularly leaders of the uh, new class, into uh, powerful committees, these plum committee assignments, which I maintain is something that she had been doing for quite a while. And Ben tweeting this thing around and commenting, this is huge. Nancy Pelosi has committed to put putting, I guess, progressive caucus members, including newly elected progressive champs on the most powerful committees in the House. Proud that move on is working with U.S. progressives and Team Pelosi to empower a new wave of leaders fighting for change. And I guess in hindsight, well, my first reaction was, okay, well, it's it's huge, but it's also old. That is, uh, over a decade old. Pelosi has been more inclusive of newly elected members, more so than uh, any Democratic leader and really any Republican leader ever from the beginning. And I can't understand why no one knows this. I'm, I was disturbed by... Why, you know, why would it be that Ben Wickler, director of Move On, wouldn't know that this is the case? And then it hit me later on, I think, really, that just like Nancy Pelosi, he was saying, essentially, look, he's saying uh, to members of the new, more newly elected members, uh, Jayapal and uh, Pokhan are not brand new, but they're relatively new. And he was basically letting them have their moment. You know, they wanted to portray it to their folks at home that they had won this concession and of uh, something that was either never done or was pretty rare and it is it is still pretty rare for brand new members to get spots on these exclusive committees and why not have their moment just as was the case with uh, the issue of creating the select committee on uh, well the green new deal or depending on, i'm not certain how they're going to title this committee but the idea of having a a committee exclusively focused on climate change as an issue. Uh, and although Pelosi was perfectly fine with doing it, and in fact was committed perhaps to doing it anyway, even without um, pressure from interest groups and grassroots activists, etc., uh, which were later termed protests, and we 
noted that that's possibly a disputed um, terminology, I guess. Uh, she could very well have turned around, and a lot of a lot of Nancy Pelosi fans on Twitter that uh, that I follow and that follow me, and some that listen to the show, and some don't, were perturbed uh, about the agreement to allow. Uh, well, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who rubs a lot of those folks the wrong way, uh, mostly because of her association, I think, with Bernie Sanders, and they're still raw about that. And they were uh, annoyed that Nancy Pelosi wasn't being given the proper credit at having established the committee last time she was speaker, and instead simply saying, you know, basically granting a victory to... Ocasio in this one. And I, at that time, I think correctly there and incorrectly this time with Ben, thought, uh, well, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ocasio needs to have that win. She's the one on uh, like thinner ice, essentially. I don't think she's in any danger in her district, but she's brand new, establishing herself in Washington, D.C. And Nancy Pelosi is well established. And she can afford to give that opportunity away to claim the victory and to be gracious about it. And everybody comes away happy. The committee gets reestablished. Uh, Ocasio-Cortez looks like she got something accomplished, and she did. That's not just to look like. Um, and Pelosi gets, I mean, she gets the committee she wanted. She doesn't get the glory, if there was any. Uh, for standing up and saying, I'm the one that's really, but she doesn't need it. Instead, she got something else she needed, which was uh, an opportunity to build a bridge to Ocasio and perhaps convince some of Ocasio's partisans that, hey, maybe Nancy Pelosi, maybe these stories about how Nancy Pelosi really is pretty liberal and progressive after all, make some sense here. And it appears to have worked, actually. So, I mean, maybe I was really too hard on, on Ben with that one. Ben, too, may have been playing the same game. But then, then, I got this uh, response from Mike Gus, who tweets under the handle of Gus Rural WA, like rural Washington, Washington State. And, uh, well, we started off on the wrong foot because I, uh, like uh, I have the pet peeve about headlines that say everything you need to know about or uh, it isn't what you think or whatever, and I, I hate people's assumptions about what I may or may not think or know. Uh, a much simpler pet peeve is picking a fight right off the bat by responding to something that I say with, um, no. Oh, does that drive me crazy? Don't do it. Uh, and Mike, well, Mike goes ahead and does it. And he starts off and says, uh, as I am saying here, now, you know, Pelosi's been really good about including new members in, uh, well, all I said was, has been, uh, Pelosi's been more inclusive of newly elected members, which Mike in his frame of mind, I guess, took to mean specifically in top leadership positions as opposed to uh, plum committee assignments or more to the point, perhaps, this also happens a lot, uh, newly created uh, quote-unquote leadership positions. They really aren't, but they're appointive offices as opposed to elective offices, and they don't come with a great deal of power, but they're a base from which you can build and move up if you prove yourself, at least in the old system of fundraising and passing out excess funds to colleagues and challengers for uh, other congressional seats and building a base of support inside the House to move up into elective leadership. And he basically considers those positions toothless and BS, and uh, that's where he was coming from. So, um, no, real leadership is the majority leader and majority whip. People in those posts are Steny Hoyer and Jim Clyburn, who are 79 and 78, respectively. The most talented members who could be exciting leaders that reflect the coalition of voters under 45 who just elected Dems fled largely. And uh, he's talking about them having fled to um, 
other contests. In other words, his article, and I guess, or his argument, and it's a little disjointed because we don't work in a thread here in this one, but if I recall correctly, his argument was that most of them fled to run for Senate or to run for governor in their home states because the options of moving up into leadership, into serious leadership, were foreclosed to them because they were occupied by people who were rock solid and apparently never leaving, Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, and Jim Clyburn. And he keeps coming back to their age and various other participants in the discussion uh, rightly pointed out, hey, this is ageist, and it is, but he was trying to make the point that I got, well, I guess, I mean, it's a, would be a, a fair point, if not a, a valid one that you would uh, accept from people in direct debate. But if the question is, well, do younger voters look at older representatives and say, we need to change because generational dynamics? And, you know, if the answer is yes, they do, even if those arguments don't make any sense, do they do it? Do they say it? Yes, they do. Oh, well, okay. Then I guess we got to acknowledge that you could try to defeat it. But whatever. But basically, he was saying that um, the real power was in the top leadership. And that's certainly true. But he seemed to be making an argument that we ought to boot out elected members, Hoyer and Clyburn, and replace them essentially with handpicked appointed successors. And though he was willing to say, well, okay, I understand the dynamic that this is an election. What you ought to be doing is you could change that in a minute, was his opinion, that if Pelosi were threatened on the floor, which was the goal of the, uh, you know, at least some of her opposition. And it's hard to tell exactly where Mike is coming from, because this is a this is a somewhat valid argument but I'm not sure whether, I mean, he's from rural Washington. Does he side with the Seth Moultons and the more right-wing gang on this? Is he ideologically compatible with those guys because he's a, a rural guy? Or is he really more progressive in his outlook and just wants to adopt their tactics because they do have a leverage point? His point was, if she were threatened on the floor to the extent that she really worried about whether or not she would be able to get this election done and remember the dynamics of it. You need a majority of the members present and voting affirmatively for some person for the speakership in order to win. And as much as we'd like to avoid it, you know, obviously coming away with a winning plurality doesn't do the trick, uh, but it doesn't destroy things either you just go to a second round of balloting the problem is that if nobody budges you go to a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and it's possibly never ending and begins to cause political problems for you very quickly in fact the second round of balloting would probably cause political problems for you since that hasn't happened since early in the 20th century i think we had the date handy last time but it was in the 20s or Possibly, yeah, 20s maybe, not as late as the 30s. I don't know. I can't recall now whether it was 20s or 30s, but probably 1925 or so was that where we pegged it. Anyway, that first flip over to a second ballot by itself wasn't doesn't undo anything and doesn't prevent Nancy Pelosi from becoming speaker. And it, it's important that everybody realize and be ready to tell people during Thanksgiving if it comes up. I, I don't know how many of you actually discuss politics during Thanksgiving but I figure you are all discussing it at some point. It's important that people know that voting for the speaker on the floor is not a binary thing. It's not like being handed a ballot and it's not like, well, vote yes for Pelosi and vote no for uh, McCarthy. I'm, I'm assuming that he wins the nomination of the Republican conference to become speaker and not uh, Jim Jordan, but who knows? But let's say it's McCarthy. Uh, it's not a situation where you vote for one or the other physically. I mean, I mean, it's, it's what you're given to do. But any uh, member can shout out any name they want. They can also vote present, and you've probably heard a little bit about that. So just to clarify what can happen down there, uh, one, if people vote present, they don't count in the total number of votes cast for the purposes of determining what a majority is. Take that number of votes cast divided by two 
and uh, round up if necessary. But uh, you, you get the idea. In order to figure out what a majority, what constitutes a majority, people who vote present don't count. But uh, if Pelosi, if everyone were present and voting for some affirmative name, Pelosi would need 218 votes to win the speakership on a fully filled House of Representatives, right, on the floor there. Um, if she doesn't get the 218, one, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Republican gets it, doesn't go that way, uh, nor does it mean that the whole thing is over. Uh, but uh, again, a lot of people were making the mistake of believing that uh, uh, Democrats who were opposing her candidacy and who were saying, as Seth Moulton was, that they would vote against her on the floor, that doesn't mean that they're going to go down there and vote for McCarthy or whoever the Republican nominee is. I mean, they might. That would be kind of crazy and that would end their careers. But that's typically not what they mean by saying that they wouldn't support her on the floor. What it means is they would go and shout some other name out, a third name, uh, almost assuredly a Democrat. I don't think any of them want to disassociate from the Democratic caucus, but they would shout some name out that A, wasn't McCarthy and didn't put Pelosi or the the whole Democratic caucus would be in danger. If you elected McCarthy as speaker, uh, there would be no point in you holding the majority unless, I mean, you can broker deals because it is awfully awkward if you don't actually control a voting majority of the of the House to try to run it as a Republican, uh, despite the fact that there's a Democratic majority, would be very difficult. You could cut deals, though, and say you can be basically speaker in name only, but that's very rarely done, though it does happen in state legislatures from time to time where things are a little wackier and people pay less attention, quite honestly. But uh, seeing that happen in the House of Representatives extraordinarily unlikely. More likely would be that they would vote for some other Democrat for the purposes of having cast a vote for some affirmative name and so therefore counting in the total and denying, hopefully, if they were, well, for their, from their perspective, they would hopefully get what? I think they said they needed 17 or more people to vote affirmatively for someone else that would leave Pelosi with a plurality but not a majority and necessitate, necessitate a second ballot. <clears throat> and if they didn't budge, at some point you would say, okay, the balloting is not changing anything. We need to either uh, come up with some alternative method of electing a speaker. And that has happened. I mentioned to you that was, there was at least one time, and it was you know a million years ago, when the House agreed to allow the plurality winner to take over the speakership. And it was a similar situation in terms of the vote counting. I don't know what the dynamics were that was driving the vote counting, but it wasn't changing. Ballot after ballot after ballot, nobody was budging. And uh, essentially it was an agreement between the two parties to just say, look, you know, we know that this is there's an intra-party fight happening here. There's no point in holding up the business of the House over this intra-party fight. We'll never, the minority said, we're not anywhere close to suddenly, you know, eking out a victory somehow. We give up, fine. We know you were going to, there was a Democrat going to be the speaker one way or the other. It might as well be you. We don't care. In fact, it probably uh, makes more trouble for you if you never resolve that issue and you won't resolve that issue if we just leave the status quo in place. Fine, you be the speaker and let's just get on with things. Uh, they could do that. They could agree to do that. And that raises some other interesting possibilities, uh, which we'll put aside for the moment. But the plan here for the right-leaning rebels was to deny her the majority. And then uh, at that crucial moment where everybody is now embarrassed and the Democrats are losing face and have to start exploring weird possibilities for just getting this job done. And the Republicans, uh, these Republicans, this minority anyway, not particularly interested in helping put out the fire temporarily so that the business of the House could get moving. They would be perfectly happy to revel in the chaos, I'm sure, uh, that they would say, uh, look, 
uh, were not going to get out of the way either. And these re- rebellious Democrats would be able to say, oh, look, if you want Democrats to be able to get around to the business of running the House and to stop this embarrassment at any point, this is what you're going to have to do. Pelosi's going to have to either step aside or, as Mike was suggesting in our conversation, you need to put it, the word out. You need to make it known that, all right, yes, the majority leader and majority whip offices are elective offices. Yes, ordinarily, we would expect to see Steny Hoyer and Jim Clyburn returned to those positions by a vote of the caucus. But I, Nancy Pelosi, refuse to step down and uh, might agree, for instance, to serve only one term as speaker and or why don't we say I'll endorse a newer, younger member for these positions occupied by Steny Hoyer and Jim Clyburn, who by some account she doesn't get along with all that well anyway, at least Hoyer, and I'll back a new contestant for this. And in order to settle this issue once and for all and finally get a speaker elected and finally move forward with our business, all of you who were convinced that you wanted to vote for Hoyer and or Clyburn, vote for someone else instead so that we can settle this thing. That was the hope of the, that is the hope of the Moulton group. And and that's how they plan to use the hostage to get what they want. And it's a, you know, it's a plausible plan. It could actually kind of work depending on how everybody reacts to this thing. I said that there was some other permutation that we have to consider at some point or some other factor that we have to consider at some point to see whether something like this would work. Uh, the, uh, for instance, the agreement as between the parties to simply let the plurality winner take over as speaker, I, it's, I would say remember, but perhaps this is new for some of you. The, the presiding officer of the House at that point is the clerk of the House. Remember that the House of Representatives resolves itself anew every two years. And so uh, there are no leadership positions at that point. They're not occupied anyway. And uh, the rules haven't been adopted. And it isn't the speaker in charge, at least not until the speaker is actually elected. So for that first thing, that first order of business, uh, electing a speaker who then presides over the rest of the work, elect, uh, adopting new rules, etc. The clerk of the house is responsible for conducting, tallying, and announcing the vote, to calling the new ho- new house to order, and holding that vote is the responsibility of the clerk. The twist in this situation is, of course, one, partisan control of the house is changing hands from Republicans to Democrats, and the party in charge usually tends to want to bring their own clerk in with them. And two, if there's any doubt whatsoever, any legitimate doubt whatsoever about who is going to be speaker, you could raise a legitimate stink about whether or not Nancy Pelosi is entitled at this point to bring in a new clerk. Why should, uh, you know, obviously the speaker has the most to say about who the new clerk would be, but why hand that decision over to Nancy Pelosi if isn't sure that she's going to be the speaker in all this? A new wrinkle I hadn't thought of, but uh, it's a far-fetched one anyway. So, you know, uh, one I hadn't considered to date and perhaps uh, justifiably so. So anyway, this is a rather esoteric uh, discussion to begin with, but uh, and it really it's going to probably require a little bit of in-depth uh, searching around and a little bit of research, it occurs to me as I'm saying it that uh, that there won't be a contest for a new clerk until there's a speaker in place and the House has constituted itself and it's ready to elect a new clerk by resolution, I guess, if I'm remembering it correctly. And so I'm guessing that the old clerk that will continue on at least for the purposes of constituting the House, and that, of course, is a Republican clerk. I don't know how that plays out. I have no reason to believe that the Republican-selected clerk of the House would agree to play politics in any way, as especially in an intra-party fight among Democrats. But who knows? 
I really have no idea. I don't think that's going to enter into it. I think it's all going to be settled well before then. I'm just throwing it out there because it's this kind of weird esoterica we all enjoy and we like playing around with and gaming out. Anyway, probably our time is better spent <clears throat> trying to uh, summarize the position that Mike was taking here rather than trying to string it together from his tweets. He did point us to a an article in The Atlantic by Elena Plot. Uh, not that long ago, November 13th, why young, talented Democrats flee the House. I think his assumption was trying to do too much work exactly in covering why all the people that he thought should try to move into leadership had been had left over the past uh, couple of, of terms. But uh, I think generally it makes a good point and uh, wise to have in there in the background and wise to consider when you're thinking about whether or not Nancy Pelosi should cut some sort of a deal either to transition out of the leadership or to transition others out of the leadership. Uh, the argument here is the lack of young challengers to Nancy Pelosi as the next House Speaker is both a symptom and a cause of her leadership. And uh, good, that gets the chicken and egg uh, situation as well right there in the subheader. One of the great ironies of the 2018 midterm elections is that the Democratic Party's emergent stars, Representatives Kirsten Sinema and Beto O'Rourke, likely would have remained nameless had they tabled their Senate bids in favor of another term in the House. This isn't only because Senate candidates can attract a brighter spotlight than they would have as one of hundreds in the lower chamber. It's because the House Democratic Caucus is increasingly viewed as an unfriendly environment for rising talent. Against a nearly two-decade-old leadership structure and term-limitless committee assignments, more and more members have begun to eye the Senate or state office as the antidote to their long-shot prospects of scaling the ranks in the House. Of course, uh, uh, aspirations to the Senate and other uh, state office and other offices has been a long-time goal of members of the House, even when things were more fluid. So I don't know how much I buy into that, but it could be a symptom. The reality has been brought into relief in recent days as House Democrats scramble to prepare for internal leadership elections later this month. A handful of members are attempting to deny Nancy Pelosi the votes she needs to be Speaker, arguing that yet another term of septuagenarian reign, presumably with Steny Hoyer and James Clyburn at the top as well, would ignore the desire for change voiced by voters earlier this month. The problem, of course, is that Pelosi's detractors have failed to put forth a viable alternative, or more to the point, I think, that they have failed to make themselves viable alternatives. That's what I would add to this. We don't just gift these positions away because it's a good idea. Of course, knowing that, they try and leverage it by threatening the election of the Speaker on the floor. That's actually not terrible thinking, not a great idea but not terrible thinking. Anyway, they argue that this too is an indictment of current leadership. It's not so much that the caucus lacks a solid bench, their thinking goes, but more that its most talented members have been given little opportunity to flex their muscles. The notion that there's no one more experienced than Nancy Pelosi is a self-fulfilling prophecy because you can't have experience if you can't gain experience. Hmm. One senior Democratic aide said, who requested anonymity, of course, our best members will keep leaving when they continue to see there's no movement at the top. It's an odd quandary for the party that consistently, consistently dominates the millennial vote and whose last successful presidential nominee campaigned on a message of hope and change. But if current dynamics stand, Democrats can likely expect yet another Pelosi-led term. This, even as a raft of young lawmakers, many of whom explicitly pledged to oppose Pelosi in their campaigns, makes its way to Washington. It's an indication that while Democrats may not have a young, or young voter deficit, when it comes to leadership, they certainly have a young member one. And party veterans worry that because of this, especially ahead of 2020, they're hamstrung, are hamstringing a crucial incubator of future leaders. The fact that Paul Ryan was a vice presidential candidate just because he was House budget chairman is pretty impressive. Former Representative Patrick Murphy, a 35-year-old who left the House to challenge Senator Marco Rubio in 2016, told me, we're not giving those opportunities to our members. I think it's led to a lot of bigger problems in the party. And we're not going to be able to get all the way through this, of course, 
But uh, again, chicken and egg problem. Uh, one, if you want to, you can, of course, attempt to rise in leadership, not just through fundraising, but as is later pointed out somewhere down here in the article, uh, social media opens things up quite a bit. And television appearances open things up quite a bit. I'm not entirely convinced that everybody who wants to move up can't move up or can't make a bigger star of themselves or can't even bypass the leadership entirely and buy influence for themselves in other ways. Certainly they can raise money and distribute it, but they can become a bigger voice despite the fact that they're not in leadership. The rest of the leadership doesn't show up in television all that often anyway. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. All right. Well, thanks for listening. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving day. I'm glad I could put this show together for you. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, fingers crossed. I'm not sure what we're going to be able to do about Friday. But by the time you hear this, that question will be settled. Anyway, do enjoy your Thanksgiving holiday. We'll be back with live shows beginning Monday. We'll see you then.